All right, good afternoon, everybody. I am going to wander far afield with the, uh, the threats and technology trends that we're seeing at NSA over the course of the past year. And uh, you know, hopefully lay out um, some useful information through our SIGINT awareness of what these actors are doing as well as what we're doing with industry to understand some of the technologies and, and other activities that are going on. So I'm gonna jump right into one of the topics that's usually at the front of everybody's mind when we start to talk about threats, and that is Ukraine and Russia. Uh, so Ukraine's emergency response team tells a pretty horrific story about the pressure um, that is on their ecosystem and their environment. There's a lot of narrative that it isn't so significant um, inside, the, uh, inside the cyber activity from Russia. But I think that's, um, that's from a viewpoint of people who aren't actively trying to defend each and every day the types of attacks that are hitting them. So if you look, there were more than 2,000 cyber attacks from Russia in 2022, and over 300 were against the defense and security sectors. So a pretty heavy emphasis on the, the, the wartime apparatus. But even more of those targeted civilian em entities. There were 400 against commercial ener industry, energy, the finance sector, telecommunications, and software environments inside Ukraine. And more than 500 um, other attacks were aimed at government entities that weren't in the defense sphere. So that's, you know, that's more than 10 cyber attacks a day going across a broad swath, swath of the infrastructure. And in 2020, 2023, Ukraine's reporting more and more integrated cyber and kinetic effects. So they're trying to marry those two together. Um, included in their space is also the, the psychology and disinformation operations that are happening. Um, if you've studied Russia and Russian techniques and tactics, you know that a lot of the information warfare um, is also a component of the things that they're focused on. So again, you know, all this data released out of Ukraine publicly, so, so what are we seeing um, from the foreign intelligence mission? Well, overall, we're seeing three different classes of attacks. The first is really intelligence collection to prosecute the war. Uh, that's to be expected, right? If there's a kinetic shooting war, you're gonna be seeking every advantage you can have in that kinetic fight. The second big set of activity is, um, is this disruptive activity that tries, to, um, that tries to break down and interfere um, with the civil society um, and, and the, the war effort itself. And then finally, the third big class is this hacktivist activity that's going on, and it can land in both of those arenas as well. So, so I'll break each of those down, but increasingly granular, you know, who's in the fight? The GRU, or the Military Intelligence Agency of Russia, really is, from the start of the war, the predominant actor. This, no, no surprise, this was a military operation, so you would expect military intelligence um, to be heavily involved. Um, and, and if you recall, Ukraine has been a GRU target for many, many years. You can go back to the 2015 and 2016 Sandworm attacks on the electric grid. You can look at the 2017 NotPetya attack um, that wound up across, uh, across the burning across the internet. Um, and, and even out in January 2022, Whispergate malware um, defacing um, dozens, more than 70 websites across Ukraine, including their foreign ministry, on the eve of the war, where they were saying, um, be afraid and expect the worst, right? So there's a history of GRU having significant activity. And although they've been pre-positioning um, uh, against Ukraine for years, the other interesting thing was they, they were clearly not well positioned for significant operations at the start of the war and clearly not ready for the invasion, right? And that, that surprised a lot of people last year that you know, they just were not prepared. But I think if you look at uh, the way the war was launched and if you look at the way operations are proceeding, 
Um, one, it was held exceptionally close at the beginning, and two, um, Russia's really not good at combined arms, whether those arms are kinetic in multiple dimensions or whether they're cyber and kinetic. Um, so, so they've struggled. The second big group involved in the Russian um, activity is the SVR. Um, SVR is Russia's external intelligence agency and they're responsible for collecting intelligence and conducting covert operations in, um, in foreign countries. So SVR is, um, is on the rise. And so GRU prosecuting the military campaign, but this, this last year, um, increasing engagement by SVR. And one of the interesting things to us is there's a number of elements inside the SVR who are responsible for information operations. And we understood that, but what we, we didn't understand is that they had a hacking um, organization and would do exploitation in cyber. We knew they would launch information operations and put material out there, um, but we, we identified a number of different subgroups inside SVR um, who are new to the hacking, hacking world and understanding um, for us at least. And um, again, the proliferation of cyber activities kind of mission creep across the elements is probably a reason that you're starting to see other pieces of, Ukraine, of the Russian SVR involved in these hacking activities. Um, the third organization involved is the FSB. Um, FSB is the internal intelligence service for Russia. Um, why the internal intelligence service caring about Ukraine? Well, they actually have the relationships and the coercive ability against those domestic hackers inside Russia, right? So they can collaborate or coerce Russian hackers in that hacktivist space I was talking about. So you've got three big bins of folks that are involved and overall stitching those together and looking at them, what you see is there's a, there's a hybrid war going on um, inside this. Um, the cyber attacks have involved critical infrastructure, um, commercial entities, logistics, and legitimate wartime targets, um, but they haven't gotten to the devastating effect I think Russia wanted to achieve and still seeks to achieve in that. And more than a year um, into the war, what we're seeing is they're settling in for a campaign. Um, there's not a, a, a crescendo or an urgency across any one group, um, but day to day the attacks go on and, and the activity um, continues. Uh, the destructive attacks that I started with primarily remain inside the borders and confines of Ukraine. Um, we've seen Russia actually take some care not to unleash the not petcha type worm and activity that can go and propagate across the, the internet to have um, an escape from Ukraine and cause damage indiscriminately. So that's a good news story for the rest of the world. Um, but one, uh, one area that I would say is a huge uptick over the past several months is intelligence gathering. And that shouldn't surprise anybody because there is a shooting war going on and you often increase or improve your opportunities in those shooting wars um, by having exquisite or better intelligence. Um, but what I would highlight is um, Army General John J. Pershing. He was uh, the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces in World War II. He was infamous for saying, infantry win wins battles, but logistics wins war. So where is that intelligence being focused a lot on? It's being focused on the logistic chain that's bringing capabilities to the fore for Ukraine. It's the, um, the Ukrainian um, movements of supplies, artillery, but also and especially the movement of foreign aid, lethal aid and humanitarian aid into Ukraine that is sustaining um, the Ukrainians' defense and, and work against, uh, against Russia. Um, so kinetic um, effects still rule, um, but there's the opportunity to enhance and buttress with cyber. So as we sit here in the US, how should we think about the ongoing conflict? Well, for the most part, it is constrained 
but because of the American role supporting, we do see a lot of activity against our defense industrial base and the logistics companies who are helping to move that aid into Ukraine, um, especially um, air-based air um, transport companies. And we're seeing them active targets of the Russians. Again, at this point, to understand the types of um, munitions and the pace and the directions they're going. Um, but increasingly, we have concerns, right? If they're getting accesses to understand US companies' involvement in the support to Ukraine, there is only a small distance and step to going from intelligence collection onto disruption. And so um, we've not seen that switch flipped, um, but we're being very, very um, careful to look for that and understand um, if Russia's gonna take that very escalatory step. So that's something um, you should be watching for and anybody in the defense industrial base, anybody involved in the logistical support of Ukraine um, should absolutely understand that targeting and the efforts going on there. Um, the, the third area I talked about were the hacktivists and, and that's an interesting activity and I think there'll, there'll probably be academic studies of this period of time written um, to look at the hacktivist role, um, especially Russia, Ukraine, but um, brought more broadly into the ecosystem. Um, what we have are, you know, the Ukrainians um, marshalling almost a, you know, a ready reserve force who are helping them defend and put pressure into Russia. But we're also seeing people, you know, take up cyber arms as volunteers from outside Ukraine. So we get people in um, in Europe, even in the US, who are just joining into that hacktivist activity and trying to bring pressure and defense um, uh, into, into the fight. Um, overall, I have concerns about that. Right? I, I truly believe that you know, hacking a nation state is an inherently governmental activity. Um, I, I'm not talking about the Ukrainians' ability to defend themselves, right? They're in a, in, in a fight for their own survival. I'm talking about um, people outside Ukraine joining in um, and, and then potentially being drawn into the political um, sphere that's related to these activities. Um, we also have the flip side where we have Russian hacktivists um, taking up cyber arms against Ukraine and bringing additional pressure. Um, several of them very skilled. They are the same folks who are in that safe haven of Russia doing ransomware attacks against the US and others. Um, but what is interesting in this dynamic is on both sides, what we're seeing is the, the hacktivist activity is being used as a cloak to hide real nation state intelligence and cyber operations. And so that causes the field to be muddied and gives Russia at times the ability um, to, to put their operations in the noise and kind of deflect it as unlawful activity, um, whether it's things aimed at them or um, whether it's the people inside that safe haven um, uh, that, uh, that do cyber crime um, for profit. The final twist in all of that is really um, the idea that the, the hacktivists out of Russia are a natural resource for Russia. And I mentioned the FSB is um, able to maintain relationships and use the, all the coercive power of the Russian government in that space. And, and that to me is pretty disturbing. So I'll move beyond Russia for a moment. China is our pacing threat. Um, it is the the, the past, present, and future challenge um, for the US. Um, there literally is a country whose aspiration is to upset the world order and use cyber as one of the means to do that. Um, and, and China's running a marathon in this space. Um, if you look at the strategic plans they, they draw up, the long-term resources they put into these investments, um, they are looking at the horizon and while they're doing daily operations, they are aiming at a point in the future with strategic plans that they want to, um, they, they want to up their capability and capacity. 
So the 2023 annual threat assessment from the Director of National Intelligence called China the broadest, most active, and persistent espionage threat to the US. And that is certainly borne out by the NSA SIGINT. Um, for, for us, breaking down the threats from the PRC, um, they are strategic, agile, brazen, innovative, and enduring. A and I will talk through some of the aspects in the past year of why I chose um, to represent them that way. Um, so the first one in that strategic space, uh, they're playing the long game, as I mentioned. Uh, they have goals in quantum computing. They have goals in big data. They have goals in artificial intelligence, pharmaceuticals, healthcare and medicine, and military technologies. So, so what does that mean? Companies in those sectors can expect to be challenged by PRC intrusions. They're happening today. They're not going to relent. They are the official policy and resource targets of that government, and they're going to keep coming at us. Um, as you would expect, those intrusions don't just target economic and intellectual property. Um, they use cyber in shaping their advantage internationally as well. So um, I, I'll call out some public examples of that. Um, if any of you saw an excellent Wired story in February, it was called China is Relentlessly Hacking Its Neighbors. Right? It detailed hacks against the Association of um, South Asian Nations. Um, that's the ASEAN organization. Um, and, and not only went against that organization, um, but also against um, the member nations themselves. So they, um, they, look to, um, they look to get into the organization, produce intelligence, preposition, and, and, uh, and create uh, the opportunities to influence the, the, the local area uh, in their backyard, um, both against their friends and their enemies in, the, in that space. Um, and it was pretty prolific, the amount of emails and data pulled out, um, both from the ASEAN element itself um, and, and the member nations. And that's very consistent with what we're seeing um, in, in terms of the hacks and the activities going on there. Um, beyond the international intelligence, there's a major effort to promote information control and information um, repression. How are they doing that? Through standards, actually. So um, PRC is very active in the international standards bodies. Um, and in fact, their participation is often four to one against any other nation in the world, giving them advantages in their technology and their information control for the future. <coughs> Why is that important? Well, standards are supposed to be evaluated and accepted based on their technical merit period. But when you stack the room, the votes go in many of these bodies by quantity, not one vote per member, not one vote per entity. And frankly, what we're seeing is this shift where um, the, the advantage is going into um, technologies that will not be Western friendly. They will not support our standards for security, privacy, and, and often will look to take some of the entities you know, here at RSA out of the mix in terms of their technology offerings. So we're seeing coordinated efforts across the PRC companies um, to counter the U.S. or allied proposal standards um, and, and, and drop into the standards a competitive edge for the Chinese technologies. Where do we see it? Um, Huawei and China Mobile coming in and alternately um, proposing the technologies that they're trying to drive um, to get into the space where they can strategically assume chair positions, for example, on some, of these, um, on some of these bodies to be able to vote and coordinate. Um, one of the, the more dire things we've seen is the, uh, the, the Chinese coming to these standards bodies and actively opposing things that can be clearly technically shown to improve the security of the networks. Um, we personally at NSA have had proposals inside these standards bodies that have been pushed back on um, simply because they're U.S. origin, um, and, and it's clear that China is, um, is trying to withhold the Western alliance and the Western opportunity to improve the ecosystem. So um, 
within those standard development organizations, we really have to bring together industry um, and our allied nations so that we're getting there in bigger quantities and with, uh, with, with pre-coordinated voices that, that emphasize the security aspects we have to push into there. So if you're a tech company, please get involved in the standard process and be sure China can't swing those um, capabilities. The second big area we see, uh, I'll call it agility. I personally hate that we have become numb to the quantity of Chinese exploitation against our infrastructure and our companies. Uh, we, we've become accepting that there's going to be Chinese hacks against us. Um, and 2023 was just another watershed year for the hacks against, um, against the US. So as I, as I look to what we saw, the volume is up, the techniques are advancing, sophistication is increasing, and, and you know, the things we've counted on of China being noisy or unsophisticated, frankly, that's starting to slip away. They will still use um, exploitation at large scale, um, but the improved trade craft over the past year is important. And one example, one of the bigger trends that we're watching and concerned about is the improved trade craft on what I'd call covert infrastructure or obfuscation networks. These are the way that they will link together multiple hops on the way from China to US victims and have an encrypted path from one end to the other that they can operate, um, operate through. But increasingly that endpoint is a hack device inside the US, a Soho router, some internet connected device that's always on, something that is in a neighborhood that has good reputation. And when I say neighborhood, I'm talking you know, an IP address that doesn't look like a bad part of the internet. Um, and, and so those devices then become the IP addresses that touch the victim. Um, the other piece that's disturbing about this is those hacked endpoints that are used as that last hop, um, they're growing in agility, the ability to, to hack a device, set it up as part of this obfuscation network, and then the ability to throw it away um, and move on to another one for the next time they have to touch. And they've increased the cycle rate in that acquire and dispose of faster than US law enforcement can go and go after that endpoint faster than a lot of the, uh, the, the intel, um, the threat intelligence teams can make a reasonable assessment that it's a bad device and it ought to be filtered and it ought to be blocked. Um, so the cycle time and the revisit time is one of the innovations um, that, that hurts us. Um, so by harvesting US devices and the node not touching them, um, they get a very short half-life that we have to worry about it. Um, and, and, and today, um, you know, our ability to patch those Soho routers, those, um, those internet connected devices um, is often lacking because they're not managed with a security team. They are often not at the big companies. They're just involved in, um, they're, they're just involved in the internet ecosystem, often in our homes or our places where they don't get patched and don't get upgraded. The next thing I would describe in the China activity is brazen. Um, I, I talked about how you know, we're getting numb uh, to the fact that Chinese exploitation occurs daily. Um, a trend we're worried about is that they are okay getting caught, right? There's not a lot of reputational damage for being caught. And, and I'll even go back a couple of years to the hafnium attack where um, there was a Microsoft Exchange vulnerability that China exploited. And when they were caught with that tradecraft, instead of kind of slinking away the way you would expect espionage actors to do, uh, they just wrote the script that scanned the entirety of the internet. And they threw that exploit at every single vulnerable device out there, right? They, they just didn't care. They made a huge smash and grab, land grab to see which ones would stick and wouldn't get cleaned off and which ones they could pull back um, information from. A and so it was, again, in this term, very, very brazen. Um, the other piece about that brazen 
um, part that you need to understand is if you're a company that's defended against an APT attack from China, uh, they're coming back, right? They, they, don't, um, they don't slink away and stay away. If they came for you for a purpose, um, they will come back with a purpose. Uh, and so um, we have to expect that, you know, with this bravado is that persistent, and in fact, the P of advanced persistent threat um, is reflecting that they're gonna keep coming back for the thing they're looking for. So I mentioned that the infrastructure innovation, but there's other areas we, we focused on. Um, I've talked for years about how China exploits known unpatched vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, you know, they can and will use that for their first, um, first choice to go after and exploit a, 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 a victim. So if you leave something with a weak password, a known vulnerability, or a misconfiguration that is easily scanned and detected, um, they, they will pop that device um, using that. But I keep spreading a lot of doom and gloom here from the, the year in retrospective. There is good news. Um, we are definitely impacting PRC operations through increased patching and security. Um, they are less able to get into the places they want to get in because of patch uptakes and some of the security architectures and the new innovations in industry. Um, so that is good, well done. Um, but the reason I know that we're having an impact on the, the, the cheap and easy exploitation is because they have to use more zero days. Um, and the uptick of China on zero days is significant. Um, I, I'll, I'll look to Mandiant who does some great, uh, some great stats. In 2021, Mandiant saw um, almost three times the number of zero days used in uh, breaches as the previous year, right? Assessing the cause of breaches in, in incident responses. Um, in 2022, there was a big increase over 2020 as well. So, so the number of zero days being used are up. Um, we absolutely agree with that assessment as well. Um, I, I've talked about other strategic moves made by China, and, and let me draw the linkage to this trend of the increase of zero days being used. Um, every year, China runs a competition called the Tianfu Cup. It provides their vulnerability research community with um, goals to exploit commercial products, and those are things like Windows, iOS, Chrome, Safari, VMware, much more, right? And if you follow that competition, they are immensely successful. So they're building exploiters, they're, um, they're finding these vulnerabilities, they, they succeed, <coughs> excuse me, at, at almost every goal they put. Combined with that competition in 2021, remember that's the year zero day exploitation exploded, um, tripled in quantity the PRC passed a new law requiring any Chinese citizen who finds a zero day, they have to pass the details to the government within two days of discovery. Um, I think there is correlation and causation both in that. Um, so they get nearly exclusive early access to vulnerabilities and they're going to drive that, especially against the high-end defended places, right? Um, so if, um, if China's going to transition from known exploited vulnerabilities over to zero days, um, we have to start thinking about architecture and capabilities that will discover and prevent lateral movement at pace. And, and so I think you need to, if you are a high-end target for, um, for China, you need to start thinking about how you posture for a world of increasing zero days especially against your edge devices, because that's the tradecraft, land on an edge device with an O-Day, and then look for soft opportunities inside. Uh, next area I'll highlight is enduring. Um, I, I talked about the zero days, but if you leave the doors to your network unlocked, they'll find the cracks and gain access. Um, well, I highlighted that zero days, they're going to use the simple and easy way in first. And, and I can give you a laundry list of things we see them using this year. And, and that includes log4 shell, right? That should be locked down, patch your log4j, 
um, libraries get secure proxy logon, proxy shell affecting Microsoft Exchange and, and, and the Exchange email servers, stop hosting, self-hosting your Exchange servers. We continue to see an enormous amount of vulnerabilities in that. Um, there's been a lot of exploitation of Atlassian Confluence server and data centers. Um, so again, if you patch an upgrade, you're in good shape, but these are things that the Chinese absolutely scan for um, and will exploit if you're running the old versions and unpatched. Um, Excellion fi file transfer appliance, Windows print spooler, Pulse Secure, Pulse Connect se um, Secure. Um, it's a smattering of things, but these are specific vulnerabilities that we know are favorites of these Chinese APT groups, and they have bulk scripts that will run and check for the presence of these devices and enable them to move, um, move quickly against it. So, um, what do we do in some of that? Um, at, at NSA, our focus is on scale. Um, how do we scale against an adversary that's exploiting at scale? Um, a, a big piece of that is talking to industry partners every day. Um, so an example of where this makes a difference, um, we uncovered, exposed, and broadly mitigated one PRC campaign targeting the US. Um, it was based on a zero day um, capability against the Citrix environment. So the campaign was identified when NSA and a DIB company were working together to follow infrastructure, again, that infrastructure connection that shouldn't have been talking to that, to that company. Um, identified the connection um, and, and then joint sat down and did joint analysis about where, where that activity originated from and then pulled it through their network about what it was doing. Um, it was interesting that it had a very sophisticated campaign that, that did things like immediately cleanse and clean logs, right, to eliminate the tracks. So if you, even if you were watching your logs, you would likely miss the initial short window of time where they came through and were able to exploit. Um, they, they leverage memory resident malware, right? So they weren't hitting things that were detected on disk, uh, did the log cleaning, um, and had pretty reasonable infrastructure, like I talked about, the agile infrastructure that looked fairly clean and benign um, coming in. So um, the, 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 the partnership between NSA and the DIB Defender also brought in Citrix, who was able to identify the flaw, get a patch out, and, and started that cycle um, to, to make sure that we could get this cleanse through the ecosystem. So our worry was that if we went too slow, the attackers would understand we knew their flaw and exploit it in other places. If, if they were tipped to detection, they'd start that same cycle of mass exploitation. Um, so we were very focused on how do we do this. We issued a hunting guide to look for the tradecraft and techniques and the things that they could, they could find. Um, we put that out to the defense industrial base and within a few hours, companies were confirming that they were also compromised, right? So that information back and forth um, in, in an important cycle. We got together with the community to do a public cybersecurity advisory and very careful collaboration with Citrix so that they could get their patches out and ready for the community and their security advisory. Um, and, then, um, and then we watched the public roll out and another um, partner in the ecosystem, a cybersecurity company watched and measured and did the metrics and after the Citrix security blog and our advisory, the number of vulnerable servers across the US, European and allied partners dropped by almost 25% in the first couple of days, right? So we had pretty good reach, not perfect because 75% still vulnerable over time, but patch rates at that level that quickly are pretty significant. So that's, that for me is impact at scale. Another observation was this was not an intrusion where we could say, hey, this is a bad IP, domain, piece of malware, something like that, simple, throw it over the fence and it gets worked. This was a couple weeks of collaboration amongst three very, very skilled teams. 
the NSA team, the DIB team, and the Citrix team. So being able to pull those together really is the future of how we get to scale because the expertise lives in the people who operate the uh, environment and the people who know the technology. And then we can see some of the trade craft to include you know, this rapidly moving um, exploitation networks um, that we're seeing. The other big push we have is um, adversary defeat. That's a whole organization now in NSA. Their job is to figure out how to give attackers a hard time. What can we do to put sand in the gears, to take the fight to them, so that they don't just keep, have the ability to keep trying and trying and trying against our companies, especially if they're gonna try with zero days, right? So what can we do to knock down and, and impede them? And that often involves the, the integration of threat intelligence with partners who can act. So for us, operationalizing the intelligence is the end piece. So if we can go to somebody in industry to make a difference, if we can go to Cyber Command, CISA, State Department, Commerce or Treasury, um, FBI, one of those partners, often all of those partners, right, in a campaign way, um, so that adversaries don't get free shots on goals. That's a really important thing for us. So um, the philosophy here is to keep the adversary under pressure because um, they're keeping us under pressure all the time. Um, so when I think about that strategic problem and us wanting to get ahead of our threat, I, I have a number of you know, horizon views for us as well. Folks ought to be thinking about quantum resistant cryptography, right? We're working with NIST to get the commercial standards out there. We're working in government to get our systems quantum resistant. You ought to have a plan to think about what's, what's um, in your environment that does public key cryptography or uses public key cryptography for authentication. And we've got to get on the path um, over about the next decade to pull that out of the environment and, and be ready for the emergence of quantum computing. Um, the other big thing we're looking out is, um, you know, what do we do to get after some of the, mal the, the zero days? And you'll see NSA pushing out increasingly um, the zero days that are, um, that are discovered and found in the ecosystem so that they can be pushed and patched. So if you see NSA talking about getting after a brand new zero day, um, there's a good chance that you know, we're, we're worried about an adversary um, who has that in their arsenal um, and, and going after that to close it down. The other big trend, you can't walk around RSA without talking about AI ML, right? Yep, absolutely, drink. Um, I think we've all seen the explosion, and, and it really is, it's, it's a technological explosion, right? It's not, it's not the buzzword, I, I won't say it's delivered yet, but this truly is some game-changing technology that's emerging. And, and so, looking at generative AI from the NSA point of view, there's three things I'm focused on. How are adversaries gonna pick up this technology? What are they gonna do with it? Two, what can we do as defenders in this world to utilize um, AI, ML in an effective way that, that recovers the advantage for us? And the third is thinking about um, what, what could be done in a, in a malign way to things that rely on AI ML. So that's not the same as the first bucket, but it's uh, how do we have the trust in it? Um, what can be done to poison the, the usual operation of it or defeat it um, as a capability? So, so we're looking across all those three veins. Um, in, in that first vein, um, in the near term, I don't expect some magical um, technical capability that is AI generated that will exploit all the things. What I do expect is the adversaries who figure out how to integrate generative technology or other AI technology into their workflow are going to outpace the people who don't and it's going to reduce the cycle time and the dwell time of attackers. Uh, it's going to do things like enable 
much more effective phishing, right? That, that, that Russian native um, hacker who doesn't speak English well is no longer going to craft a crappy email to your, you know, your employees. It's going to be native language English. It's going to make sense. It's going to pass the kind of the sniff test of the whatever topic it's trying to, to, to convey. So, you know, that right there is here today. Right? And we are seeing adversaries, um, both nation state and criminals, um, starting to experiment just with the chat GPT type of um, generation to give them English language opportunities in their workflows. Um, it is going to help um, rewrite code um, and, and make it uh, in ways that, that will change the signature and the attributes of it, right? If you look at the things that Copilot will do in writing code, um, you can have things refactored, restructured, or give it an English language dis uh, discussion of those activities and have it generate some code that will give you a new, unique look and feel um, that, that are going to be challenging for us in the near term. Uh, so, so that's kind of where I see some of the threat space, but I'll tell you, buckle up. I think the, the, the innovation cycle on the development and the innovation cycle on people creating use cases to execute with it is going to be really rapid. And next year, if we're here talking a similar year in review, I think we'll have a bunch of examples of where it's been weaponized, where it's been used, um, and where it's succeeded, right? Um, in the second bucket of defense, we've got, to, we've got to get the similar effects for us on the defender side to be able to utilize the technology. Um, it's showing real promise in being able to do um, rote things at scale, um, you know, scanning across massive amounts of logs, being able to pull patterns out, to be able to correlate known CVEs and other things into your data streams. It's really impressive how it will accelerate and add machine-like focus to enormous piles of data to prioritize the things you've got to get after first. Right? And, and so that's the accelerant for defense, is it is a, it is a huge amplification capability uh, to make our defenders better. And I think you'll see some of that emerge as well. And then finally, um, you know, as, as people understand models are out there, there's going to be folks who look to manipulate them. And I think that's a really open area for research and, and study right now is how do we get trust and assurance in some of the things that we're going to start counting on um, in, in the generative AI and other models. Um, Future really is in automation, and this generative AI is going to exponentially explode automation and valuable automation um, in that. So not going to replace people in jobs, but the people who learn to use AI will probably replace the jobs of the people who don't learn to use AI. Um, 702. So if you're, if you're tracking the US government policy discussions, FISA section 702 is an authority um, that lets the IC, the intelligence community, collect communications of our most critical foreign intelligence targets who are non-US persons located outside the US. That's a really key constraint. That's what this is built for, who use US infrastructure. Um, use that U.S. infrastructure to, um, and services to communicate. And, and by that, what I mean is we have a safe haven here for malicious activity um, that, that is given our rights and protections um, if we don't have 702. So we cede home field advantage if Section 702 goes away. And, and this authority was born in the days of counterterrorism where we had foreign... Um, terrorists um, using, you know, free web mail out of the U.S., using communication services here, and threatening the U.S. Um, from these overseas activities where the communicants were foreign. They weren't, they weren't inside our country, but we had the, the, the data here. Um, 
what it has evolved to is it is now increasingly important in the cybersecurity threat landscape, understanding um, everything from the, the, the ransomware actors to the people in nation state phishing campaigns and other things who, who are using these services and continue um, to be vulnerable because of that. And so uh, at the end of the year, this sunsets if we don't get a reauthorization. So hopefully you will continue to hear over the coming year the use cases, the justifications, and the examples of how this has helped protect this community. Um, and, and especially talk about the rigorous oversight and control um, that, that's bound up with this um, to make sure that it's used responsibly and accurately. Um, I'll finish with this last focus area, partnerships for impact. I talked about um, the example of the Citrix flaw that, uh, that we were able to see. Um, you know, the idea of a trusted product like that that's so integrated in the, the highest assurance operations is really valuable. What we're finding is um, our reach with foreign intelligence combined with the, the might of industry to find some of these things on the systems or in the technologies um, that we depend on is a really powerful combination. So it is not us throwing a thing over to industry. It is an active cycle of engagement, rinse, lather, repeat, and activity that then um, is used um, to, to give us the advantage in the defense. And what we're finding is if we understand a threat and we're able to to protect a defense industrial base company through one of the major providers or through a technology company or through some sort of partnership, at that point, it becomes protection for all of us because they don't fix it for that one company. They fix it in the ecosystem. So that's being a pretty big advantage for us. So I've gone through a number of significant threats in the past hour, hopefully giving you some food for thought and exposed a little bit more about what we see and how we see it. Um, this is not just a one and done. Um, the threats facing us evolve and change. And what we see across this is um, the partnerships matter, whether it's our foreign partnerships, whether it's our partnerships with industry or across the US government. Um, so, so looking for um, the, the, your ability to connect with us. And we're also hiring. If you're looking, the NSA booth downstairs. Um, there's still some cool stickers um, and other things. Go play with an Enigma. Um, learn a little bit more about what we're, uh, what we're doing and, and, uh, and how we do it. Please stop by. So I've got a couple minutes, I think, for questions. Two. I can take two questions. All right. You talked about the promise of AI and machine learning and the expected explosion that is coming very quickly. If we look at the effect of that, it is just as likely to accelerate and do exciting things for us as it is to send us back to the Stone Age. <laughs> to what extent is the NSA play storming public-private um, engagements on the notion of complete civil disruption, which is a likely a possibility with AI ML in the mix? Yeah, so I, I'm leaving the, the complete societal meltdown to some of the big think groups that are bringing together um, the, the research. We are involved in the near-term practical applications, and you know, I think the policymakers and the tech industry are gonna take that, you know, the, the, the extreme event on um, for study. Yes? You mentioned, uh, specifically standards, you know, how their they're Chinese are specific, have been for a long time trying to influence standards. How do you see the rise of BRICS playing into that, specifically, say, the, uh, with India joining BRICS, going away from the, from the US-based G7 type operate, uh, organization? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. For, for those of you not familiar, um, there, there is a consortium um, around the BRICS, the R and C in that is uh, Russia and China, but there's others with, uh, with Brazil and India, um, for example. Um, 
that's a concern, right? They are, they are gathered together and often that, that collaboration is because they like the repressive technologies. Yeah. And so uh, they do form a voting block um, in that space. And that's, that's even more, lends even more importance to the reason that we have to get serious about standards in the US between government and industry, but also with uh, like-minded folks that, that want a liberal, secure world. So, okay. All right, thanks team. I apologize, uh, I've gotta run.